Fanning. Weekends on 2FM. Now, back in February 1992, the Welsh band Manic Street Preachers released their debut album, Generation Terrorists. And now, 30 years later, comes album number 14, The Ultra Vivid Lament, is what it's called. Back in the early 90s, the band kind of fashioned themselves on the pistols and the clash. You know, they were on a mission to kind of restore a bit of revolution back to rock and roll. Since then, the albums have really come in all shapes and sizes. And this new one here offers loud piano bits, soaring guitar solos, and of course, catchy hooks at every turn. So if you're looking for clues to their early provocative declarations of intent, or maybe their later 90s commercial highs, well, there's examples of all of that from start to finish on this latest album. Let's meet the Manic's Nicky Wire after this from Manic Street Preachers. So, Nicky Wire, Manic Street Preachers, how's it going, Nicky? Not too bad, thank you, sir. Just prepping for a long day of hearing my own voice. Hearing your own voice. Well, I'll tell you one thing that's like, I mean, different with album number 14 here, The Ultra Vivid Lament. This is one that you, could I say the previous 13 times, you didn't necessarily mostly write on piano because you did with this one. Absolutely. James wrote it all, you know, I'd say 90% of it he wrote on the piano. He just, you know, wanted to try something different. And especially during lockdown, he really dug in and got um, annoyingly good <laughs> on the piano. And the, the songs were just flowing. And I did give him a different cadence. And a, I tried to write lyrics that were much kind of easier to sing to go along with the, the melodies he was coming up with. So, in other words, like if you want to get to something that's really good in terms of a decent song, is this a different way? Like, does it change your whole approach to writing the melodic runs, the chord progressions, all that? Yeah, I found it did. As you know, especially in terms of the lyrics, I was writing to suit. So, I think in in every way, really, it just it created a different angle for us, which was really enjoyable. You know, it is, we have written a lot of songs, as you know, and um, just felt refreshing to come from things at a different angle. And if we can go back, is there, can I say, you're not against an 80s feel from ABBA to Echo and the Bunnymen? Absolutely not. No, I'm not pretending that we've uh, we've written the musical rule book at all. It's from, you know, Waterloo in 73 to Dance, or 74 to Dance and Horses in 85 is the sort of the musical framework of the record, really. A lot of classical sounds, classic sounds with a kind of glacial 80s sheen to it, hopefully. And when you say dancing horses, as in bring on the dancing yes. horses, as in Echo and the Bunny Man, as in uh, Manic Street Preachers Live, r- r- playing that during their concerts? We have, yeah. We're just, I don't know, we're just bashing around in. We're, we're a really awful jamming band, but for some reason, Echo and the Bunny Man songs we seem to be able to do. It's probably because they're so ingrained in our consciousness. So uh, we were just messing around and it just, just seems to really fit. So it's a, it's a nice breathing space within a sometimes frenetic set. Indeed. And were they the first band you ever saw live, Dinky? Yeah, James, Sean and Richie both saw, that was both their first first gigs. I was a really poor gig goer. Really? You know, I just <laughs> stayed in and watched the darts probably that night. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't many darts on TV back then. It's a bit, you much, could find it. It's, well, yeah, I suppose you could find it somewhere, <laughs> all right, yeah. By the way, just as a matter of interest on the subject of ABBA, um, do you think Motorcycle Emptiness channeled Dancing Queen in any way? Yeah, it did. The run-up. I remember saying it at the time, but the run-up that the la 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 is was totally nicked off ABBA. And we were always influenced by um by our parents' record collections. To be honest, you know those classic greatest hits, be it yeah. be it a Glen Campbell or Carpenters or um, ABBA, a lot of greatest hits. I'm a big believer in greatest hits as entry points to yeah, to absolutely. Uh, you know, funny thing is that um, ABBA, the minute people talk and look at look at them now with their avatars and their yeah. kind of everything else going on and touring the world or touring someplace in London that they built especially for it and all the rest. But um, the thing about ABBA is that people go, oh, yeah, great songs and that. Do you think the rhythm section of ABBA was a bit overlooked? Absolutely, uh, they're the most kind of in the pocket unappreciated because they're so delicate and they just let everything else work around it. You know, they're so brilliant. And me and Sean did try in, on this record just to let, you know, to keep out the way. The great Charlie Watts thing, really, where if you've got a guitarist mm. and a singer like James, then, you, you, you know, you let the other things flourish, really. Do you know, a funny thing is, if I look back, say, on the 80s, then, if it's any kind of an 80s thing, some of the bands that would have meant nothing to me, and I'm trying to see, is there something I could glean from it now with, like, distance? And bands like Fiction Factory or Wang Chung or Lotus Eaters or China Crisis are, of course, the biggest of them all, one of the best. I shouldn't put them in the same group, really, as Talk Talk. Is there a bit of all of that with you here now? There is. I mean, we did a cover of Feels Like Heaven a couple of years ago, really, which really worked again. And I, I guess it's that moment, you know, when a pop 
pop record just comes out of the blue and transpo- yeah. transports you to somewhere else. Certain bands are lifestyle bands. Like I love of, of The Clash or whatever. It's much more about the whole package. But that certain songs just arrive out of nowhere, take you to a different place. So there's a, there's a lot more of that in this record, I think. Well, the different place, making this record, is it kind of you've come through something even though we're in the middle of a pandemic because, um, you know, with the last album, Resistance is Futile, um, your parents were both dying of cancer on the run-up to that. It was, a, I presume, a pretty damn difficult time for you. It was, to be honest. You know, I'm back and forth doctors and hospitals and uh, me and my brother looking after my mum and dad along with my dad who got ill a bit later. So, uh, yeah. And I think resistance is feel I was as moments of brilliance, but it was it was really hard to, to get a consistent record together. You know, I wasn't in the studio so much and just all those things. And then my both my parents died and I think that is just reflected in the lyrics. In a, in in the not just in desolation but sure. in the warmth and the gratitude of actually having them and missing them, you know. Every day I count myself lucky that I I did have them. Of course. And by the way, just one side to that, which is nice to know, that it was album number 13, Resistance is Futile, was your biggest album since This Is My Truth, Tell Me Yours, in terms of sales. It did all right, yeah. <laughs> just so you can never, never can tell. Can no, it? you really can't, can you? That is a mad thing. I mean, looking back now over all, this, all these years, you know, the one thing I do know is you don't actually know. <laughs> you, yeah. think you, yeah. you think you've done something amazing and then something else pops out of the blue. I remember You Love Alone coming out of nowhere. You Love Alone is not enough. And not only in the UK, but all of a sudden you get an email, like it's number one in Hong Kong or it's number one in Singapore. And It's a lovely feeling knowing that there's a song by um, the Go-Betweens, a, a song called Finding You, about a song which will always find someone somewhere. And that, that really resonates with me on this record that is, you know, you've got to stick in there because some, someone somewhere will always find something in your music. Yeah, and, well, in fact, the, the first someone somewhere who found something in your music, and you mentioned Hong Kong there. Let's go back 30 years, well, 29 years to be precise. Tokyo 92, Manic Street Preachers go off. Were you just, like, the typical example of, like, what are they making all that noise for in the airport? Who's behind us? Oh, God, yeah. it's us. <laughs> it was really, you know, quite staggering because even though British bands would always have a good time over yeah. there, we were particularly huge you know without knowing it and we did look behind us thinking black crows were on the airplane or guns and roses or something because we were mobbed as, as we were in thailand as well and but the, the kind of deep richness of that first tour that never left us from japan i think we've probably been to japan more than any other country in the world outside the uk and ireland really and it's always been very good for you yeah, and it's just, oh, I don't know, there's, some, there's, there's just a majesty and an unknowingness. You can never know Japan, which I like, you know. You never really quite know what's going on. <laughs> it's a nice feeling for once. Right, always a good reason to go then, I suppose. Right. OK, we're talking to Nikki, as in The Ultra Vivid Lament, which is the new album, the 14th album, that is, from Manic Street Preachers. Let's take a little bit of this here, which was the first thing we heard from it. This is Orwellian. <laughs> Orwellian is the name of the song. Manic Street Preachers were talking about the Ultra Vivid Lament is the album. Um, knowing that you have a track with Orwell in the title, everybody who's a fan of Manic Street Preachers would know you're not just picking that word out of the ether, that you have actually read, no doubt, the social criticism and his support for democratic socialism and everything from Animal Farm to 1984. In doing so... Um, where are we living these days? Uh, we live in Orwellian times. And you do say um, it, it feels impossible to pick a side. That bit I don't get. Why is it impossible to pick a side? Um, because I think when you've, when you've sort of witnessed an endless culture war um, from extremes from both sides, I never feel comfortable within those extremes, I guess, on, on either side. It's nothing to do with being centrist. It's just, I guess my, my politics are rooted in... in Bevan and Attlee, yeah. you know, that, that's my a sort of classic Labour position, I would, you know, I would argue, which doesn't seem to manifest itself as much as I would hope in politics today. I guess that's the best way of describing it. Yeah, and even... The song itself is about the misuse and, and the battle for words and the battle for meaning and claiming meaning, you know. Um, I mean, our biggest ever song, Tol- If You Tolerate This, was obviously inspired by Orwell's homage to Catalonia, so... 
it's not like I've just gone to sure. wiki, wiki quote and picked a few things out. And you do say, you know, like the people machines making fools of us. I mean, in, in 1997, when Labour got in for at least a very short space of time, you said, great, after all, everything from John Major to Ma- Margaret Thatcher, maybe yeah. something will happen. And you're never totally happy with what Labour does. But I mean, at the same time, you do go on about the eaten, educated politicians, etc., uh, yeah. on the current album and that. So, like, it's kind of... You're always fighting up against that, aren't you? Yeah, the atoms that sort of that made us and what, and what form us, formed us as as a band and as, as our political beliefs, they never change. But in, the other thing is when you get a 50, you know, it is a, it is exhausting on all levels. And self-preservation does become a factor for your own kind of men, mental survival. And um, I think when you're bombarded... By constant opinion, you know, and I, I look back to growing up as a Cold War kid, there was much more certainty in right and wrong, I guess. Mm. And I think levels of confusion do align to degradation of one's mental capacity due to age that does create a, a fog of confusion. I think it's better, I, all I'm trying to do is be honest about that, that, that the absolute certainties perhaps that um, I grew up with are, are not quite so relevant. Uh, you know, as they were before. Well, the fog of confusion, I mean, in this post-truth world, if I can put it like that, everybody from Boris Johnson to Donald Trump or whatever, they can say something on a Tuesday and completely and absolutely lie and contradict it three days later and people just seem to accept it. I mean, exactly. you know, information overload is definitely a thing, but it's not the problem. For you, the real danger is the proliferation of disinformation. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and the manipulation as well, the constant manipulation of, um, you know, of anything... Uh, any kind of statement or anything that goes wrong. And l- like you said, the way that the news cycle moves on mm. um, so quickly. So quickly, yeah. Uh, I, it, yeah. It's truly, I remember when we were writing Faster, me and Richie, in a, in a room, and we were going on about the acceleration of culture. <laughs> I think back then, and Richie was still using a portable typewriter. And we, we even then we were thinking, God, things are speeding up. You know, and it's certainly... If he, if he was around now, I think he'd realise how much it has speeded up. Do you know, if you go back to a track from the last one, The, the Broken Algorithms and the Frightening yeah. Evolution of Social Media and all that, the internet, I mean, on, on many levels, do you fear it? And you think, yeah, you should fear it on many levels. I'm, I'm not sure if fear is the quite word, because the, the genie's out of the bottle and there's no yeah. going back. You know, A big influence on the album was a book by Jill Laporte. Um, if Then. But, yeah, which goes back to the people machines and the original sort of precursors of... Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, and um, you realise how, how long it's actually been rooted in our culture, and um, how the the explosion really that, that that's happened in the last I don't know ten fifteen years. I mean, it's just impossible to grapple with. So I admit defeat on that one, but I, I'm just incredibly sceptical, sceptical, I guess, about the 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 information that is on there. Yeah. I am a sceptic anyway, you know, naturally. Okay, well, going back to the band itself, Manic Street Preachers, and just, I mean, is it fair to say, well, no, hold on a second now, that's stretching it a bit, that, that if I look at Lifeblood, Futurology, and uh, the Ultra Vivid Lament, the current album, that there's a trilogy there of some sort? I think there nearly is. I do, yeah. I think there's a, there's a kind of uh, a glistening melancholia that, that, that drapes itself over those three albums. Futurology probably is, is a bit more... Uh, slightly a bit more positive in some of the words, but um, there is, there's an overarching kind of high modernism, a sort of future that never arrived, mm. um, which there's a grain of that through those three records. I think, you know, there's that version of the band, there's the sort of post-punk journal for Plague Lovers, Holy Bible, and then there's the, the more uh, everything must go, send away the Tigers, yeah. cards version of the band. So, Do you know, a funny thing is, you bring out an album and then the next one is, ah, I see where they're going now, I see where Manic Street Preachers are, and then the next album, no, wait a minute, hold on a second, what's this? It's kind of like there's an arty avant-garde side, uh, an out-there side, and then suddenly there's radio-friendly stuff, and they're not always yeah. on the same album. I mean, do you build on positives from the previous album, or do you react against them? Um... I actually believe a lot in negative capability. I, I'm, I'm kind of a bit overwhelmed by this constant search for positivity and taking positive things. I'm a big believer in negativity. So uh, I think probably what sustained us over the last 14 years is that sort of hyper-realism when you get things right, when you get things wrong, or when you just don't care. You know, there's those three three options. So uh, I wouldn't say it's a... I think we struggle with uh, 
with positivity in the band. <laughs> yeah, I suppose them. in some ways what I almost mean is some people might think you've mellowed on something and then suddenly, bang, in your face, Manic Street Preachers of old or Manic Street Preachers of something else or of tough or whatever it happens to be. Just one last thing I want to talk about here is um, oh, a very important question. Yeah, Do you take pictures on your mobile phone or do you take pictures on your Polaroid 600? Uh, still mostly on my Polaroid. Right. Um, I don't actually have <laughs> an iPhone. Do you not? So... I've got like one of those burner phones you see online on DT. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not particularly a, a political choice in that. It's just I can't, literally can't be bothered to change my, my SIM card. Sure, I get you. Okay, months. political choice it's not. But what about a choice of studio? There's something about where you made this album. Tell me yeah. about just what there is. I know there's history, but what else is it about Rockfield? Do you just feel at home? Yeah, it's, it's a myriad of things. It's, it's like the... I don't know, it feels like the residential Abbey Road. You get that same feeling in Abbey Road that there's, there's something infecting you with uh, creativity, and that's what happens at Rockfield. You know? Even though it's not far from where we live, you feel like you're totally separated, that you're 100% focused, and um, you realise all the records that have been made there and the people who have been there. And just For us, it is a, it's a truly magical place. And did you record the album with a mask on? I did. Right, yeah. James okay. obviously couldn't when he was singing. Yeah, right. And also, <laughs> by the way, with the ultra vivid lament, um, just one last thing about it is: um, do you think, in some ways, that you you had this one together more than? A, I mean, a lot of times, band goes into a studio and they just faff around for six weeks and see what happens or whatever. Did you have this well rehearsed beforehand and knew what you were doing? Absolutely, yeah. I think that's where I was meant with resistances. We barely actually played the songs together. You know, everything was done bit by bit and it was it was very fractured just because of the nature of the time but with this album we rehearsed really hard and we went in and did it in about two and a half weeks really in Rockfield and then did a, a few bits of overdubs at our own studio but we were really really on it really um just probably the most well rehearsed in Send Away the Tigers which even though it was a different record we went yeah. to Ireland and did that in three weeks yeah and just just it feels good. You can't do that every time. All right, it feels funny. good and it sounds good too. So listen, Nicky Wire, thanks a million, Nicky, for talking to us on the programme today. It is Manic Street Preachers. The album is out now. It's the 14th. It's called The Ultra Vivid Lament. And I presume when gigs are allowed in Ireland, as they are elsewhere, you'll be back over here at some stage. Absolutely desperate. It did feel really sad looking at the two itinerary, realising there was no Dublin Olympia or whatever on there because... Yeah, it's always one of Actually, the I remember bands. one of the last times you were at Dublin Olympia when you did the whole of the Holy Bible and I was on stage talking to you there playing records or something. I don't know what it was. You wanted somebody to play. I don't know what that. I can't remember. Yeah, you were our first port of call. Sir. Our first port of call. On that note, Nicky, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much again Thank for you, talking man. to us. Good luck. Thanks Take it easy. Bye. 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 Dave Fanning. Weekends on 2FM.